and you're like, okay. <clears throat> Good evening, people, to Facebook Live. Uh, or not Facebook Live, but <laughs> Bikes with a Message Facebook, or uh, Facebook and Twitch Live. Um, so, oh man, it's been absolutely crazy for me trying to figure out how to do this without any interruptions. I'm here in my room again, and uh, boy, today has been busy for me. <laughs> I was like going absolutely crazy trying to get stuff done. I woke up, actually my mom woke me up. Uh, she had a doctor's appointment and uh, we had to rush there to get to the doctor's appointment and uh, <laughs> so uh, her her surgery is not until um, Monday so you guys could be praying for for my mom that uh, everything will go smoothly um, and God would guide um, the um, process so I don't know why it's a five instead of a three I'm gonna have to change that on there um, and on my bikes with a message uh, contact uh, it's nine nine four oh three not not nine not nine nine four oh three or five um, it's not that. So, anyways, welcome to Faith, uh, Bikes with a Message Live. And my this is my bike ministry. It's called Bikes with a Message. I sell bikes for a low price. I also fix up for a pro, low price, which is repair of the bike. $5 is labor, and then whatever the bike needs, then that's the up. Uh, take a ride with Jesus. You can contact me at Martin P. Anderson. My phone number is 208-669-0456. My address is 1337 McCarroll Street, Clarkston, Washington, 99403 instead of 5. Uh, my email is martchildofjesus316 at gmail.com and so um so anyways what we're going to be looking at is a little bit more on samuel but before we start uh let's start off with prayer and ask god to help us um through this study let me see if the volumes up okay cool i got some videos to show i also got some hebrew names that we're going to be looking at and so um so it's gonna be a good time tonight so let's uh open up with prayer and yeah father god thank you for your word thank you for uh life and thank you for your word that breathes life and lord Thank you for the Bible. Thank you, God, that it um, tells about you. And thank you, God, for the love letter, which is the Bible. Um, because without it, Lord, we wouldn't know who you are. And I want to thank you for everything you've done, Lord, in my life and everyone's life. And I pray that you would speak to us tonight. And... I pray that you would speak to me, Lord. And I want to thank you and I praise you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, where we left off was uh, 2 Samuel 3, 1, which is another chapter. Um, I'm going to be probably doing a chapter poss possibility of like... Um, every Saturday uh, because this Saturday my mom had an appointment and it wouldn't I wouldn't have time to get up there and work for eight four hours and rest and 
and all that. So, um, so that's why I'm doing live on a Thursday. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, let's uh, pick up where we left off. And uh, if you remember, uh, in two that we were going on is, let me look on here, where we left off. And that was Second Samuel. Let's see. Second Samuel 2. Well, actually, 1 and 2. Because I went two chapters. So, uh, where we left off was actually where we were reading from 1 to 2 is the death of Saul and also uh, Eshabath in two became king uh, but before he was anointed king David anointed as king of Judah and uh, it was it was pretty cool even though last week, I didn't have that great of videos because my internet's not that great here. <laughs> uh, all we got is Central Lake, so uh, we don't have fiber or any or anything like that. All we got is DSL. So, um, so this this time I have um, uh, my computer plugged into. Um, into the, I uh, see if I can get it to full screen. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, it's going. All right, so uh, I have it full screened. So whatever comes up the screen and like the videos or whatever, uh, then it's gonna go on the screen. <laughs> So uh, that's where we left off last time. And um, so let's uh, read on to um, the next chapter. Uh, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And, and David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And the sons uh, were born to David at Hebron, was the firstborn was Amnon. So Amnon is, is this is how you pronounce his name. Psalms H five fifteen, and known, abnorm, and known, and the form just below that, Ami known, Ami non, Ami known, and it means faithful. So the ones that was born to David, it's what David. Well, it's what God did through David. Okay, so. Uh, the house of Saul became weaker and weaker, but the house of David became stronger and stronger. So, um, the oldest son of David, the rapist of uh, Tamar, and that's farther on what we're going to be reading, but uh, slain by Absalom. Uh, and that's what we're going to be reading on farther. So, um, so anyways, let me see if I can get, I'm still trying to get used to this. Oh, right, come on. And sorry, guys, still trying to get used to this. Ah, come on. Uh, uh, of Amihan, uh, um, Hamihan, and this is his name in Hebrew. 
Strong's H293. Achino M. Achino M. And his name, his name means, um, brother is delighted. So, um, let's see if I can get where I can. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to do this. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do it from now on like, like this. Because um, then I can get to it. And um, so, uh, Jezre of Jezreel. And his name means... Psalms H thirty one fifty seven. Is the L. Is the L. Is the second entry. Is the L. Is the L. And I mean, God sows. All right. Um. <laughs> so uh, N. His second chala, uh, chilab. And this is how they pronounce it. Strong's X3609. Kilav. 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 Uh, like his father. So, uh, he was faithful. So, the second son by Abigail. So, David, his wife, was Abigail. Isn't that pretty cool? So, um... The widower, uh, widow of Nobel, Nobel of Carmel, and the third son, a uh, third of uh, Absalom. So David had Absalom. Uh, let's see, let's see if I get it. Strong's H fifty three. Avi Shalom. Shalom. And it means my father is peace. Oh man, that's pretty cool. So basically it basically says that where uh Jesus is our peace and David, if you replace King David with King Jesus. Father is peace. So in Isaiah, I don't have this on the screen. So in Isaiah 9, it says, uh, Okay, for, a, for, to un, uh, for to us, it, or for to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be the, called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isn't that pretty cool? My Father is Peace. Oh man, that's pretty cool. So, um, we got, what do we get with, which one do we get here? Of Abigail. So, did I do Abigail? Oh, I didn't do Abigail. Um, <clears throat> so Abigail. Strong's H26. Abigail. 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 And 
It means my father is joy. Wow, that's pretty sweet. So Jesus again, if you go to, um, uh, actually, um, Jesus is joy and he's peace and he's patience. That's what he is. And if you go to um, Galatians 5.22, and that's what it says here. It says in 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. So that's what we need to be, is peace. That's what David was. That's what, um, and see, peace means that after battle, there's peace. It's not you get peace instantly. Um, it's after you fight a battle. Like, for example, uh, it's like, if, for example, if, say, our U.S. soldiers went for World War Three, for example, uh, and we win World War Three. We will have peace. You know, I'm just using that as an analogy and just, a, I'm not saying it's going to happen. But, or for example, World War II, okay? We had peace, okay, for a while. And then we had other wars that we got into it. But after the war, there was peace and joy. Okay, that's what Abigail's name means, is joy, is, let me bring it up again. It means my father is joy. Okay. Uh, the widower, widow of Nobile of Carmel, and the third Absalom, so, uh, I think we covered that. The son of Micah, Micah, and this is how they say her Strong's name. Strong's H, 4601. Ma'cha, Ma'cha. Ma'cha. Second entry. Ma'chath, Ma'chath. It means oppression. The daughter of Tama, Tamai, king of Gersha, Gersha. So Tima, Timai. Strong's H eighty five twenty six, Talmai. Talmai. There we go. Um. The it means furrowed, furrowed. Um. So I got a video that's going to come up. This is Harbron. Look at that. Isn't that cool? Look at, that's Harbron. Oop. It's an aerial, aerial view of Hebron. Well, a little bit of a interruption. 
told you my internet's not that great. But it wasn't like that before. Um, they grew a lot. So. And Haran is, if you get a map of Israel, I should have had there on there where it's at, but um, it's, if I can remember right, it's in the middle of, like, a little bit lower than Jerusalem, if I can remember right. So I'm not endorsing that. <laughs> uh, back. Oops, slideshow. All right, uh, and the fourth, a uh, Denajan, a uh, So this is his name. Strong's H138. Adoniyahu. 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 It means my Lord is Jehovah. And it's the fourth son of of uh, David and S S Solomon, um, Solomon's rival rival for the throne. So the son of Haggat. Strong's age twenty-two ninety-four. Hagith. 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 And it means festive. Wow. A wife of David and mother of Adenajah. Adenajah. Um. Adab, Adanaja, <laughs> Adanaja. <clears throat> so, uh, the fifth shop, I, I was memorizing that word. It was shop, shop, um, shop, I think that's how you say his name. Strong's H eighty two o three, Shepetia. 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 And second entry, Shepetiahu. Shepetiahu. So it means. <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> Woo. Um, Jehovah has judged. So, just like David, his, his army got stronger or his people got stronger over Saul's, Jehovah has judged. A son of David by Abedel, Abedel. So, David had two wives. Actually, he had more than that. Uh, David's fifth son. Uh, the son of Abdel, Abdel. Abdel. 
Oh. And this is how they pronounce. Strong's H37. Evital. Abitel. Abitel. And it means my. Let me see if I can go, scroll down here. My father is the do. <laughs> or my father is the do. <laughs> A wife of David. Okay. And the sixth is Atherim. Atherim. Strong's H thirty five oh seven. Yeth Ream. Yeth Ream. And it means prophet, prophet, uh, prophet of the people. A son of David by his wife, Agalon, Agala, the sixth son of. And born in Hebron. So remember, we were seeing Hebron. See how much it grew? It's from the sons of David. Okay. David's wife, uh, these were born in, to David in Hebron. So, um, Actually, you know what? Um, while there was a war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, uh, the daughter of Yom Yaha Yaha, and this is her name Strong's H three forty five Aya Aya and her name means uh, Falcon. A, a Horite, son of Zura, Zuraban, father of Rizha, Saul's concubine. So, and Elisha Basat, Elisha Shab. Elisa Boshath said to Abner, why have, why have you gone into my father's concubine? Let me see if I can... Oh, it goes back. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure this thing out. <laughs> okay. Then Abner was very angry over the words of Elisha Alicia Bolsotha Bolsho Ali Alish Bolshiath. There we go. And said, I am a dog, head of Judah to this day. I kept show, uh, showing steadfast love to the house of Saul and your father. This is this, uh, to his brother and to his friends. I have not given you an in to the hands of David, and yet you have charged me to 
day with a fault concerning a woman, God did so to Abner as more also if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to me. So, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and uh, set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. So this is Beersheba in Hebrew. Strong's H884. Be'er Sheba. Be'er Sheba. Be'er Sheba. And it means walls, wall of the sevenfold oath. A city at the south edge of Israel. So that's pretty cool. And El Eishabosheth. I can't say his name. Oh my gosh. Um, could not answer Abner. Uh, other words, because he feared him. So I got a video of Beersheba or Beersheba. Currently, I am standing on the Tell of Beersheba. Uh, as I walk around this way, you see a reproduction uh -oh. of what a well would have been like. Uh, you see it's on the outside right here. of the um, uh, city. And right here, this is the other wall, because of or the, the animals. well, to one of the animals. and this is the well. Here. Over here is, is Tell Sheba. Uh, that are passing by, so that um, Tell Sheba. Um, Tell the Sheba to offer hospitality uh, for foreigners and strangers as they pass through the land. Um, this is uh, more of the area in this uh, place, just to give you a brief uh, surrounding area of what the Sheba looks like on um, the western side of the city. Uh, you can see what it looks like. Uh, it's uh, in and again, it's uh, pretty dry. Um, we have some water systems that go through this area to help uh, bring water into the area. Uh, beer means well, and so because you have a couple of water systems that come into this area, you've got uh, well systems due to the water that passes underground. Now, as I come over to the uh, the well over here, you can see uh, down, you can actually hear the rock as it passes down. It's about 300 feet or so down. Okay. And, He just dropped a rock. So he, I guess it's probably about three <laughs> or so feet deep. All right, so uh, I'm standing on the tell of Beersheba, the uh, home city of uh, Abraham. Uh, this is uh, one of the cities that he was from, uh, lived in during the year. Uh, this would be uh, more like his uh, winter home, as it's further south and more in the desert. strangers and foreigners. Now along this uh, area, there was a trade route that moved in this uh, area. So he was set up for uh, uh, to be able to protect these people, but probably also charging a tax for people that would pass through because he offered protection with his uh, many soldiers. And, um, and also uh, he had uh, access to resources. Um, this place is, uh, has uh, wells all over the place due to the wadi systems um, that the water travels under the ground and so it's uh, he's able to uh, access those and uh, but this is mostly grazing area as you can see uh, but it's a very well 
uh, preserved city. Uh, you can see some of the walls are very well um, uh, preserved. And uh, you can see part of our group down there. Uh, so you can even see the size of the city. It's, it's rather large. Um, but it's, it's quite interesting that you can see this. Right in the background. Right here. See it? Right up here? In the area. That's what he's looking at. You can see part of the one of the Y systems. But right here. Right there. And so uh, you can see that uh, he, the city is well set up for uh, be able to sustain itself uh, throughout the year. So isn't that pretty cool? That was Bathsheba or Bathsheba, uh, in the Hebrew, it's Bathsheba. So, um, let me get to... And Abner sent messengers to David. So Abner, this is his name in the Hebrew. Strong's H74. Avnea, Avnea, and the form just below that, Avinea, Avinea. And Ab Abner's uh, name means my father is a lamp. Saul's cousin and army captain treacherously slain by Joab. So, that's ah, pretty cool. Send messengers, so Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, to whom does the lamb belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. <clears throat> and to his, to, I oh know, and he said, good, I will make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you, that this uh, this you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael. So Michael, is, this is her name in the Hebrew. Strong's H forty three twenty four. Michal. 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 And it means. Uh, who is like God, daughter of King Saul, sister of Jonathan, wife of King David, and mother of, who is that? That's weird. Anyway, uh, I don't know. That's weird. Uh, daughter of... Oh, no, mother of five, given to David as wife for the bride price of a hundred, a fil a hundred Philistine foreskins, uh, while still married to David, her father gave her in marriage to another, Petio. Petio uh, at the death of Saul, King for uh, David forced her to return. So that's what Blue Letter Bible says. Okay, Saul's daughter. When you come to see my face. So this is in uh, the. The Berean Bible, Mecca, Mecca, uh, seven, eighteen. Who is like 
a God who is like a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgressions <clears throat> for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not remain his uh, retain his anger forever because he delights <coughs> delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread out the iniquities under his under feet. You will cast your all your sins into the depth of the sea. Uh, got wet the whistle. Ah. <laughs> um. You will show steadfast love, or show faith, uh, faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you shown to our fathers from the days of old. That's pretty cool. Yeah, praise you God for that. Okay, oops, out of the, sorry about that guys. So, uh, 2 Samuel 3, we're still in 3. Uh, 2 Samuel 3, 14 through 39. We're almost halfway through the chapter. Then David sent messengers to Ish Boshat. Uh, Saul's son saying, Give me my wife, Micah, Michael. And that's what we looked at. And so I'm not going to go into that one. For whom I paid the bride price of a hundred, a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishabosheth uh, sent to sent or uh, sent and looked her took her from her husband Bethio but Beth Pathiato I can't say his name uh, the son of Elias uh, Elash, but her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Ben, 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 ben Then Abner said to him, Go return. And he returned. And Abner uh, confronted, conferred, conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, For some time past you have been seeking David as king over you. Now then, bring it about, for the Lord has promised David, saying, by the land, by the hand of my servant David, I will save my people from the hands hand of the Philistines. This is this is God talking and saying David is gonna conquer the Philistines. Okay, let me show you something really quick here. Okay, remember. Uh, in, in, the um, um, where David's, well, actually he slayed Goliath in 1 Samuel. Let me see if I can find it. 
Um, okay, so from the Philistines, um, where's that? Seven nine to Goliath. Where's Goliath? Anointed as king. Maybe it was farther back. Captured the ark. I can't remember. I think David is in when he's slain Goliath. I think it's in Second Samuel. Sometimes I get confused on where it's at. Um, where the event, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say story, because today means story. Uh, story means fairy tale today. But if I say true event, then that's that's what happened in Pat in the history. Um, yeah, I think it's in Second Samuel. So we're gonna be looking at in Second Samuel. We're gonna be looking at King David. Maybe I, I'm not sure if it's in Second Samuel where David slays Goliath, um, or maybe it's in First Samuel. I sometimes can't remember where it's at. Mm, I think it's in Second Samuel. Um, geez, I can't remember. Okay, so it is in, it is in First Samuel. Ah, <clears throat> that's right. Fights the so. Okay, so. See if I can find it. Ah! I went to this king. Oh, Goliath. There we go. It's in 17 in 1 Samuel. <laughs> anyway, just like uh, in 1 first, first Samuel, David slayed Goliath. My, uh, now, uh, now then, bring it about. For the Lord has promised David, saying, "My, uh, by the hand of my servant David, I will save my people from Israel, or save my people Israel from the hands of the Philistines and from the hands of their enemies." So, just like it's uh, with David and Goliath. So let me. Let me le read a little bit on, on uh, what happened in the past. So, now the Philistines gathered to their enemies for battle. And they gathered at Shekho. Sekoth. <clears throat> Sekoth. Sekoth. Um, which belongs to the belongs to Judah and encamped between Succoth and Ahazka in Ephraim uh, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Adela and drew up their li in line for battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, uh, with a valley between them. <clears throat> and there they there came out of, out from the 
camp of the Philistines, a champion uh, named Goliath of Gath. Gath is in uh, Canaan, and he was a champion. Matter of fact, he was nine feet tall, if we're going to be reading, uh, whose height was six cubits, six cubits, uh, and span, uh, uh, in a spear, span, span, uh, he had a helmet, or he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, so not mail of what we get in the mailbox, but chain mail. So chain mail or in today it'd be Cavalar. So Cavalar it's basically um uh I think it's chain mail but I'm not sure. Um but uh coat of mail and he weighed uh, weighted the coat of uh, was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slugged between his shoulders. Uh, the swift of a, where is it? Uh, the shaft of the, of his spear was like a wolverine, wolverine, woven beam. And his spear had weighted 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bared, bare, uh, went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks, uh, to the ranks of Israel, "Why have you come out to draw for battle? I am, I am, I not a Philistine?" And are you not servants of Saul? <laughs> uh, chosen a uh, chose a choose a man for yourself, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me. Then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be uh, be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defiled the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Then Saul and all the all Israel heard it, these words of the Philist, of the Philistine. They went. They were dismayed. And greatly afraid. <laughs> oh. Now David was the son of uh, Ephraite of uh, Benjamin in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle 
and the name of his three sons were who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shema Shema Shema. David was the youngest, and the third, the three youngest or the three oldest, uh, followed Saul. But David went back and forth uh, from Saul to feed his sheep at Bethlehem. From Saul to feed, oh no, for forty days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening and jesse said to david his son take for your take for your brothers an ephod of perched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> oh my gosh. Woo! Um, where was I? Evening and morning. Jesse said to David, his son, <clears throat> take for your for your brothers an ephod of of this perched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Uh, I'm in 18, verse 18 of uh, First Samuel 17. Um, also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their, their thousands. See if your brothers are well, well, and bring some token uh, from from them. Now Saul and they and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, Elah, fighting with the Philistines, and David arose early in the morning. And left the sheep from the keeper, and with the a keeper, and took the provision and went to Jesse. Uh, as Jesse commanded him, and he came to the encampment, as the host. And so basically, what happened? I'm gonna go down farther. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go down to um, 31 in First Samuel 17. When the word of the uh, that David spoke was um, were heard, they repeat, repeated them before Saul, and he sent him uh, for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fall. Let's see. Oh, wait a minute. No. Show better. Okay, let's go down to third 41. Okay, my bad. So this is where um, this is where David slayed uh, Goliath. Um, and the Philistines moved forward and came near to David. 
and with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he dis disdained or no, disgraced him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And that's a little, little case G. Uh, the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds. For of the of the air and to the beast of the field. Then David uh, said to the Philistine, "You come to me with uh, a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of Hosts, the God of the armies of Israel." Whom you have defiled this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, or my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. <laughs> uh, and I will give the, the dead body of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, just like Goliath said, and to the wild beast of the earth, <clears throat> that all the earth may know that, the, that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord Sir saves not with sword or and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will say, give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran, ran quickly and towards the battle line to meet the Philistine and David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead and uh, the stone sank into the forehead uh, and he fell on his face to the ground. David prevailed over the Philistine and with a sling and with a stone <laughs> and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. That's what it says here. Okay? Even though this is in 2 Samuel, but David had this before. He was used to this. You know? <laughs> he was used to this. Straight up. <laughs> uh, then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled, and the men of Israel and Judah rose with a great shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath, 
and the great gate of Akron. Isn't that pretty cool? So, like it says in 2 Samuel 3, now then it began it it being it about for the Lord has promised David saying by the hand of my servant I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of their enemies. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> I just started thinking about that event of what happened with David. David was used to this. I mean, literally, he took out a Philistine. <laughs> So, uh, this is the archaeology of the, or the biblical archaeology of the Philistines. If you read Genesis, it mentions the existence of Philistines interacting with the patriarchs. However, it's widely known based on archaeological data that the ethnic group known as the Philistines did not migrate to Canaan until around 1200 BC. Right. Thus, Genesis is assumed to be an error when it mentions the Philistines in the land during the days of Isaac, back in the Middle Bronze Age too. But perhaps we need to look at what the biblical authors mean by the term Philistine, and if there's any Bronze Age evidence for their existence. Before we get to the Philistines, it's important to note it is impossible to deny that there are updated place names and people groups in Genesis, which even conservative scholars accept. Genesis 11.28 says Abram went out from Ur of the Chaldeans. It's generally agreed upon that the Chaldeans did not exist in the region of Sumer during the Middle Bronze Age. And it's plausible a later author updated the text to help a later audience by adding in a reference to the Chaldeans. Genesis 14 says Abram went into the land of Dan. But no one would have called it Dan back then, because Abraham's great-grandson did not exist yet. Genesis 47 says that Jacob and his family settled in the land of Ramesses. There are no texts which indicate this area of Egypt was called the land of Ramesses during the second intermediate period, and was most likely only associated with the name Ramesses during the 19th dynasty. Abraham's own name is probably also a later Hebraized form of an earlier Middle Bronze Age name. The name of Abimelech might be a Hebraized form of a name that shows up in the Amarna letters. So updated language with regards to people groups and city names was not uncommon. And we explained that biblical texts would be expected to be updated in a video on how biblical texts were written. We can see this happening in an Egyptian work called the Tale of Senua, where the later 13th century version has updated language and place names, even though the original work dates back to the Middle Kingdom. So for starters, it is plausible the word Philistine is a later designation for people who live in the land of the Philistines, similar to the other examples in Genesis. Second, just like today, there are multiple ways of identifying people for example, you could identify me by my ethnicity of being Scotch-Irish, or my nationality and call me an American, or where I currently live and call me a Tucsonan, or by my birthplace and call me a Pittsburgher. If we were to talk of Native American tribes that existed here 500 years ago, it would not be anachronistic to call them Native Americans, even though there technically were no Americans yet. No one living here called themselves an American 500 years ago. The European settlers, who were the first people to call themselves Americans, had not migrated to the region or established the nation of the United States of America. Yet no one would attack a historian and say they made an historical blunder for calling the indigenous people here Americans before the colonists arrived. In the ancient world, people could be identified by their land 
and often more more so than their ethnicity. Kurt Lesher Knoll says, the ancient label Canaanite was not an ethnic designation or a means of personal identity. In the ancient text, Canaan was a geographic term designating very roughly the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. As a result, many ancient documents define a Canaanite as anyone who lived in the land of Canaan, regardless of ethnic background. So just like the term American today can mean anyone living in America before or after the nation was established, the ancient term Canaanite referred to anyone living in Canaan and did not necessarily right refer around there. to an ethnicity. Right here. We can see something similar with the term Amorite. The Sumerian term for Amorite meant Westerner, and they seem to have equated several people migrating from the West as Amorites. Mark Chavela says, it appears that the Amorites were not a people in any ethnic or political sense. The idea that they were social outsiders also appears to be outdated. Porter has proposed that they had social ties to local populations, i.e. mobile herding communities belonging to the same peoples as their settled counterparts. Thus, they were not a separate people, but one dimension of a general populace. In the biblical text, Amorite can be equated with Canaanite, suggesting the terms were much looser than we presuppose and didn't necessarily have to refer to distinct ethnicities. However, Philistine might also not necessarily refer to a specific ethnicity, but could signify someone from a general region. Now, when it comes to Genesis, excluding the table of nations, the first time we hear of Philistines is not the people group, but the land of the Philistines. This could just be the same as when Genesis 14 identifies a region as Dan, or when Genesis 47 identifies Goshen as the land of Ramses. These are updated place names for a later audience. Just like how the updated version of the Tale of Senua changes the older location of Kadem with an updated name Kadesh. Or like how we could say the Dutch founded New York, even though they called it New Amsterdam. The real problem is Genesis 26, where it says Isaac dealt with actual Philistines, including their king Abimelech, signifying the authors thought there were actual Philistines in the land, instead of it just referring to the land that would later be inhabited by the Philistines. As far as we can tell from archaeology, there were no people we have later identified as ethnic Philistines in the land of Canaan during the Middle Bronze Age. From what we can gather from DNA and archaeological evidence is that the Philistines didn't arrive in Canaan until the Bronze Age collapsed, around 1200 BC, and they seem to have resembled an earlier Mycenaean culture. Egyptian records mention a coalition of people groups called the Sea Peoples that attacked Egypt and they were repelled. One of the groups of the Sea Peoples sounds very similar to the Philistines, and so many scholars think the Philistines were one of the groups of the Sea Peoples. After being repelled by the Egyptians, they settled along the coast of Canaan, or as the Bible refers to it, as the land of the Philistines. The prior homeland of the Philistines is debated. However, most believe it was somewhere around the Aegean Sea, which aligns with the biblical texts. Biblical authors say a group of Philistines came from Kaftor, and this tends to be associated with the Aegean area. Some have suggested that Kaptor is the island of Crete, the homeland of the Minoans. But there are problems with identifying Kaptor with Crete. Egyptian texts seem to disassociate Crete with their word for Kaptor. A more likely explanation is Kaptor, at least in the biblical text, probably just refers to a general region of the Aegean world, not a specific island or a section of the coast. And likewise, the word Philistine in the biblical text is probably also just a general word that refers to anyone from the Aegean or inland Greek region. Just like if we lived in Israel, we could generalize and refer to anyone coming from that region as invading Europeans. You can see this throughout the Bible. In Deuteronomy 2, it says Kaptorim came and destroyed the local inhabitants of Gaza and settled in their place. However, soon after in Joshua 13, the city is identified as a city of the Philistines. So this suggests the Kaptorum could be a type of Philistine. 
2 Samuel 15 identifies Cherethites, Pelethites, and Gittites as coming from Gath, which is also called a Philistine city. Zephaniah 2 and Ezekiel 25 seem to equate Philistines with Cherethites, which might refer to Cretans. Philistine, at least in the biblical text, appears to be a blanket term for anyone from the Aegean world, not a specific ethnicity, similar to how the term Canaanite or Amorite worked. So just because we can identify a distinct ethnic group as the Philistines, this doesn't mean this is what the term meant in the biblical text. The evidence suggests it was a blanket term for various people groups from the Aegean or Greek region, or someone that may have been affiliated with Mycenaean culture. So just because Genesis 26 refers to Philistines and Canaan, in the biblical sense, that probably doesn't refer to the later sea people that arrived around 1200 BC. The authors are probably just using the term Philistine as a blanket term for people in Canaan from the Aegean and Greek region. A similar idea is probably behind the word Aramean, and there is some evidence for Bronze Age references to Arameans. Richard Hess says, Arameans in inland Syria appear to have been mentioned in Egyptian sources as early as the beginning of the 14th century BCE. Further, the equation of the Alamu and Arameans moves attestations of this tribal group back to the Mari period. The Arameans may illustrate the identification of an early group of people by a name commonly associated with a later group of people from the same area or otherwise associated with them. We find another illustration of this phenomenon with the appearance of Philistines in Genesis. This is no different than what we as modern people do with ethnic groups. We identify the people of this region as Greeks, even though they were not called this until the Roman era. Yet there is nothing wrong today with calling the ancient Athenians or Spartans Greek, even though they identify themselves as Hellens. We call the people of this region Mesopotamians, even though Mesopotamia was a Greek term applied to the area. No one from ancient Sumer called themselves a Mesopotamian. Historians can refer to the ancient Shang Dynasty as Chinese, even though the term Chinese comes from the later Qin Dynasty that conquered the region. Even Josephus at one point uses the term Jew to talk about Samaritans, even though at other times he seems to distinguish them as separate groups. So why is this exact same practice only a problem when it comes to the biblical text? Philistine and Aramean seem to just be blanket terms used to represent someone from a specific area, not a specific ethnicity from only one time period. In terms of archaeological evidence, we do have a wealth of data of an Aegean presence throughout Canaan in the Middle Bronze Age. Middle Bronze Age Hazor has evidence of Middle Minoan pottery. In Galilee, we have found a Middle Bronze Age palace that contains Cretan-style frescoes. Stephen Collins has reported evidence of Minoan artifacts at the biblical location of Sodom. Cypress-style pottery has been found in Megiddo and in the south at the location of Gerar, where the story of Genesis 26 takes place. At Gerar, we have also found Minoan-style graffito and other artifacts that resemble Minoan features. So the evidence suggests much more than the importing of goods, and that there was probably an Aegean presence available for the native Canaanites to hire or trade services with. Kenneth Kitchen concludes, Thus it is conceivable that Abimelech and his retainers, especially Fickle, may also once have been Captorians, or even Carathites, before Philistines later became a blanket term for non-Canaanite Aegean people in that part of southwest Canaan. Also, this is not to say there was a massive presence of Philistines yet, like what happened later during the days of Saul and David. Only that it is likely there were earlier groups of Aegeans who were in the region to trade goods and services with the native Canaanites. And the biblical authors seem aware of this Aegean and Greek presence and simply blanket them all as Philistines. Like a weakened blanket, the ancient people of the Shang Dynasty as Chinese even before the existence of the Qin Dynasty. Genesis 26 is only an error if we don't use the biblical definition of the word Philistine. Last, with regards to Genesis 26, 
Some argue this passage of Isaac, making a treaty with Abimelech, is too similar to when Abraham made one. So it's likely a mythic tale that was applied to both Isaac and Abraham, and then both were inserted into Genesis. Kenneth Kitchen responds by noting that Abimelech of Gerar should have successive treaties with Abraham and Isaac is no more a doublet than Tommy Sharuma of Aleppo having successive treaties with two Hittite kings, Mursil II and Muwatalis II, first summarized in the second, or than Karwata kings of Tarkhan Hasa having successive treaties with no fewer than three Hittite kings. There are no doublets or triplets here, and none need be found in the Genesis examples either, except on flawed a priori theory. Finally, we need to discuss the mention of Philistines in the Table of Nations. DJ Wiseman and DI Block have argued it represents a Bronze Age survey of nations, based on early indicators within the passage. However, many argue it should not contain the Philistines, since they do not appear until later. But as we've already noted, the biblical use of the word Philistine is used for a broad range of people from the Aegean and Greek regions. And the mention of Philistines in the Table of Nations seems to support this notion, as it notes a group of Philistines from Kasluhim instead of Kaftor, which might indicate a different earlier group of Philistines before the second arrival of Philistines from Kaftor. Block says, the difficulty may be resolved by positing a series of successive waves of sea peoples who moved in from the Mediterranean and settled in Palestine. The first of these, the Palazgo Philistines, may have inhabited and again prior to the arrival of the patriarchs. A later wave may have come directly from Kaftor, but their origin could well have been elsewhere. On the other hand, ethnic terms were not always used precisely, and the Kaptorum and Kaslehim may have been closely associated. Perhaps the names were even used interchangeably. So the Philistines within the Table of Nations may very well have been a distinct group from the later Philistines that arrived with the Sea Peoples, given they are distinguished by having a different origin. On top of that, we have some Bronze Age evidence of people that appear very similar to how the later Philistines were depicted in Egypt. On the island of Crete, an artifact was found known as the Feistoff's disk. The language on it, called Linear A, has not been deciphered yet, so we have to be cautious with using this artifact. However, the disc most likely dates to the Middle Bronze Age, around 1700 BC, and it does appear to have a symbol of a man with a feathered headdress, which is similar to how the Egyptians depicted the later group associated with the Philistines. Other similar depictions have been found on Crete, and seem to indicate the Philistines, in the general sense, already existed and were known, which the later specific Philistines of the Sea People descended from. So in conclusion, we cannot judge the Bible by our definition of the word Philistine. The biblical authors seem fine blanketing several people groups from a general region as Philistines, just like how they call several people groups Amorites or Canaanites. Thus, given the definition of Philistines, Genesis is not an error when it says the word Philistines in Canaan during the Middle Bronze Age too. Right. The evidence indicates they were just speaking of people from the region of Greece and the right. Aegean, and we have plenty of evidence of various people groups from those areas having a presence in Canaan during the days of Isaac. Isn't that pretty cool? I mean, that is really cool. So that was Philistines, Biblical Archaeology. Uh, Abner also spoke to Benjamin. So Benjamin came from Jacob. Now, Jacob uh, was, that was the brother of uh, Joseph, which Joseph was sold into Egypt. Now, um, and he was sold into Egypt and then he became Zephanapaneah and then he uh, married Asenath, which is his wife, and he had Manasseh, and I can't remember the, the, the other boy, I can't remember. Anyway, um, Benjamin 
was his brother. Now became the Benjaminites. Okay. And that's a, lot, a little bit farther of what we're going to be studying. But, um, and when Abner became a, to, went to tell David at Hebron, uh, at, or all that Israel, all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin saw, house of Benjamin uh, thought good to do. Then uh, when Abner came with 20 men to David at Hebron, uh, David made a feast for Abner and to and the men who were with him. And Abner said to David, I will rise and go and I and will gather all Israel to my to the Lord or to my Lord the king and uh, and my Lord the king which is David because he was appointed as king that they may make a covenant with you and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Wow. Okay. Just then the servants of David arrived with Joab from a raid, beginning much, uh, bringing much spoil with them uh, but Abner was not with David at Hebron, for he had sent him away and he uh, had gone in peace so this is what peace means Strong's H 79.65 Shalom, shalom. Shalom. It means complete, completeness, soundness, welfare, peace, completeness in number, safety, soundness in body, welfare, healthy, prosperity, uh, peace, quiet, tranquility, Contentment, peace, friendship, um, of human relationship uh, with God, especially in covenant relationship. Uh, peace from war or peace of subject. So that's what uh, Blue Letter Bible says on that. When Joab and all the army that was with him came, it was told uh, Joab Abner's the Abner the son of Ner Ner uh, came to the king, and he has let him go, and he was he has gone in peace. Then Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent me, sent him away? So that he is, he, he is, or he is gone. You know that Abner, the son of Ner, uh, came to deceive you and to know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you are doing. So, this is the section of 
Joab, Joab uh, murders uh, Abner. When Joab came out from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from the cistern of Susia, Susa, Susra, Sisera, the but David did not know about it. And when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took he took him aside into the midst of the gate to speak with him uh, privately. And there he struck him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Ashihau, uh, uh, Ashihau. So this is Ashihau. Strong's age sixty-two fourteen. Asael. Asael. And it means God made nephew of David, son of David's sister Zerah. Zerhoreah, and brother of Joab, and the Be Abishai, swift to swift of foot, he was killed by Abner when he pursued him in battle and caught him. So. That's pretty cool. His brother, afterwards, he, when he had heard of it, he said, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord for the blood of Abner, the son of Nor. May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon all who all his father's house and may the house of Joab never be without one who has a discharge or who is leprous. So this is uh, leprous. This is the Hebrew word. Strong's H, 6879. Sarah. 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 And it means to be diseased of the skin, be leprous, to be a leper, to have leprosy. Or who holds a spindle, or who falls by the sword. So, remember Saul? He fell on his sword, and, um, or wait a minute. No, that was way later on. Anyway, who holds a spindle, or who falls by the sword, and who lacks bread? Or all, or who likes bread? Uh, so Joab and Abishai, uh, his brothers, his brother killed Abner because he had put their brother Ab Asahel to death in battle at Gibeon. David mourns for Abner. So that's, I got a video of leprosy. Folks, biblical leprosy isn't what you think it is. In fact, it's not leprosy at all. Let me explain. 
In 1868, Norwegian scientist Gerhard Hansen discovered the biomedical cause of leprosy, an extremely chronic but not very infectious disease. Basically, it causes a loss of sensation and a progressive though painless ulceration of the extremities. Facial nodules develop, deforming the face. Sorry, guys. But leprosy very rarely affects the scalp. It is never white in color. The ballooning skin condition translated wrongly as leprosy in your English Bible sounds like a completely different physiological condition. In fact, in some instances, it is not even a condition limited to the human body. Leviticus chapters 13 through 14 describe a repulsive scaly condition, perhaps something like psoriasis when on skin. Whatever the real biomedical cause of this condition, it was not modern leprosy. And Leviticus notes that this condition could be found even on clothes and the walls of homes. Paleopathology studies ancient health and disease in humans and animals on the basis of archaeological remains, such as bones, fecal matter, dried blood, and so forth. With only one isolated skeletal exception, Paleopathologists have not found any other evidence of true leprosy in human bones from the ancient Middle East that can be dated earlier than the 6th century Common Era. So, biblical leprosy may have looked repulsive, but biomedically speaking, it didn't harm anybody, unlike Hansen's disease. Why then would such a physically harmless phenomenon be considered so serious to our Israelite ancestors in faith? Whatever this condition actually was, Israelites who suffered from it were excluded from the worshipping community. This was because, being found to deteriorate skin, clothing, and walls, it was interpreted as a destruction of essential social boundaries necessary to distinguish us from them. Insiders from outsiders, clean from unclean. Therefore, biblical lepers had to live apart from the community, a fate worse than death for any Mediterranean collectivist personality. So biblical leprosy was something far more depressing and distressing than a simple skin problem. Remember, for Mediterranean biblical people, there was no life except group life. No conscience except group conscience. No self except group self. Therefore, it is impossible to underestimate the impact of suffering and isolation. Mediterranean cultures are gregarious and group-oriented people. They need community to live, just like a fish needs water to breathe. Without community, social network, connections and relations with others, the other-directed Mediterranean person suffers and can even die from seclusion. This is the condition Jesus healed. By doing so, he restored poor Israelites to wholeness so that they could participate in the forthcoming Israelite theocracy, the kingdom of God. My friends, the polluting skin condition described in Leviticus chapters 13 through 14 was definitely not Hansen's disease. That is what the modern world would call leprosy. The Hebrew and Greek words should not be translated as leprosy in the Bible. But there is a lot to learn from the stories of Jesus healing lepers, including the excluded. Who do we today exclude in our churches? That's actually true. Who are we excluding? I mean, see, I had this trouble with someone with, and I accept her as, you know, a sister, but she was saying the Christmas tree. We can't use it for evangelism because of Jeremiah 10. Now, Jeremiah 10 is talking about the heart of the person, not a physical Christmas tree. Now, um, 
Yes, the tree is is pagan, but I don't have it every year, and I don't worship it like the pagans do. Now, with the leprosy is what he's talking about is is already excluding um, people that have different religions. I don't. I don't like like in Mormon, for example, or for example, if someone that disagrees with me, I don't exclude them. I, they may be wrong, but but I don't exclude them. I'm like, hey, brother, come on. This is the truth. We need to get to the truth. You know? And I don't exclude him. And I don't say, why well, you you you're a bad guy because you don't want the truth and all that. And you know, no, I don't do that. See. And that's that's what the Bible is talking about is where is your heart? Okay, that's what God said. Where is your heart? See? And, and that's what Jesus was doing to show the Jews, like, hey. And most of the time that he was healing a leopard, it was sometimes in front of a Jew. Okay, so uh, for example, if I could find that passage, and let's see here, cleansing the leper. Excuse mm. me, before him. Let's see, sternly. So, for example, in Mark, he's saying, And a leper came to him, uh, impaling him, and kneeling before him, kneeling, said to him, If you are, if you will, can, can, you can make me clean. Move to move with pity. Stretch out his hand, or uh, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer your cleansing as what Moses commanded for proof to them. But he went, uh, he went out and began talking to, open, uh, talking open freely about what, about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the town. But our uh, was out in the uh, the exclusion uh, the excluded uh, exclusion places. The people were coming to him from the quarter. So let's see. I think there's another one in uh, Matthew. I think. Who's a leopard? Let's 
Let's see, what was the one that he did in front of? I think he did it in front of a person, or in front of some Jews. Cleanse the leopard. Okay, so in Matthew, it's the same thing. Uh, so let me see if in Luke, um, cause uh, each gospel, and we'll probably go until seven. Um, let's see, where is it? Forgotten where is that? Anyway, um, he basically Jesus healed leopards. Like what he was saying that Jesus spoke or touched the leopard and he was healed instantly. Um Matter of fact, uh, this is a reference to what he was doing to the leopard, but he's telling the Jews, okay? So, while Jesus was speaking to a, a Pharisee, asked him uh, to dine with him. So, he went in and reclined at a table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he had uh, had not first washed his hand before dinner. Okay. The, and the Lord said to him, "Now you, uh, now you Pharisees, clean cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish." But in you are full of greed and wickedness. Leprosy is the same thing. Um, you fools, did not he who made you made the outside make the inside also? So he's talking about Genesis 1 27. <clears throat> in the beginning, or er, uh, God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Outside and inside. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you fools, did not he who made the outside make... Ah, dang. <sighs> Sorry, guys. It's a little itch. Um... Make the ends, uh, make, oh, let's see. Also, the, you fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But he gave as, as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees. And see, Pharisees, they knew in the resurrection. They knew of, now the Sadducees, they didn't believe that. They didn't believe in the resurrection or even, you know. So, but woe to you, Pharisees, uh, for you tithe mint and rue and everything or every herb and nectar just and the love of God those are neglect the justice and the love of God those who t uh, taught uh, to have done who uh, without neglecting the others Woe to you, Pharisees, you, uh, you, for you love the best seat in the synagogue. 
and greeting in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and you uh, and people walk over you over them without knowing it. So the lawyer said, once uh, one of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these, you insult us also. <laughs> okay. But see, leprosy is quite like that. It will, well, it, if you have a dirty heart, disease see but it's because of the fall it's because of genesis 1 or genesis 3 that the serpent deceived adam and eve same thing they are deceived the pharisees are deceived and people today they have spiritual leprosy. Straight up. Spiritual leprosy. So, anyways, uh, moving on here. We're almost done. We're almost done. Then David said to Joab and to all the people who were with him, tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and mourn for Abner. And King David followed the batter better. They burned Abner at Habron, Habron, and the king lifted his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept, and the king lamentated uh, for Abner, saying, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hand were, uh, your hands were not bound, your feet were not fattered. As one falls, before the wicked, you have fallen, <clears throat> and all the people weep again over him. Then all the people came to pursued, pursued, pursued David to eat bread while it was yet day. But David swore, saying, God do so to me, and more also, if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them as very everything that the king did pleased all the people so all the people and all Israel stood that day uh, that it had been done the king's will to put to death Abner, the son of Noor. And I think this is the last slide. And King said to, uh, to his servants, Do you not know that the prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I was gentle, gen gentle today, though anoint, anointed king. This man 
the son of Zephyrah, uh, are more sovereign than I. The Lord paid, repaid the evil, uh, evildoer according to his wickedness. So, wow. So this is where we're gonna leave off. Uh, it's almost seven, but isn't that quite interesting? We're talking about leprosy and it's spiritual leprosy. <laughs> King Saul became a leopard, and died. Okay, but spiritual, not physical. Spiritual. Um, now, uh, this is where we're going to leave off. And then we're going to pick up here next. Um, uh, next. Um, probably next Saturday. Uh, if my schedule will. You'll just see a, a notification pop up. But. Um, I'm going to try next Saturday. So, um, so anyways, uh, let's close up in prayer and, uh, yeah. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this, uh, chapter in, uh, second Samuel. Thank you God for David and his faithfulness to, uh, follow you. And I uh, thank you and I praise you God. I pray that you would be with the people today and this week or the rest of this week and uh, into next week. I just want to thank you for everything you've done, Lord. Thank you for this time. Praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So next Saturday, we will be, I will be on again, uh, continuing in 2 Samuel Four, and it's going to be a really short chapter, I'm hoping, uh, <laughs> unless the Lord shows me some passages, but anyways, um, I will talk to you guys later, and uh, yeah, so, so anyways, I will talk to you guys later, take a ride with Jesus, see ya, bye.